Hello everyone, my name is Matt. I'm a grad student at the University of Washington, and today I will be telling you about whale watching in inland Indonesia. This is a paper that my collaborators Jenny, Michelle, Sudish, Curtis, and Curtis uh, worked on, and in it we analyze a small, remote, internet-based community cellular network. So what do I mean by remote? Uh, so if you think about a, the world on a spectrum of places that are easy to connect, to places that are really difficult to connect. Uh, the places that are easy to, con to connect tend to have a lot of people in them and tend to be more dense. Unfortunately, where most people designing standards and technology live is in this part on the left. Also, unfortunately, this is where most measurements and use cases of how the internet and the web work come from. And so these measurements and use cases tend to dominate the technical discourse. Uh, in this work, we're explicitly focusing on this part on the right-hand side of the curve, on the tail of the curve. So today we're looking at a network in Bokandini, Papua, Indonesia. Uh, this network was deployed in partnership with a local internet service provider uh, and an elementary school, and it augments an existing Wi-Fi mesh network in the area. The network covers most of the town from a single site, and you can see the site there on the left. Uh, and the entire site was built with uh, capital expenditures of less than 8,000 US dollars equivalent. The network operates with a prepaid model, and so these models are pretty common in many parts of the world. Uh, and users buy credit in the local currency from a reseller, uh, and then asynchronously convert that credit into data to be used for network access. Uh, an important thing about this network, and that's common in lots of remote rural networks, is that the connectivity back to the wider internet and the, the web as a whole is extremely constrained. Uh, this network is served by a geosynchronous satellite and has only three megabits of download capacity that's shared among all users in the network. And it also has really high latency, so 500 to 600 millisecond round trip times. So specifically, this network is a community LTE network. Uh, and these are interesting because secondary use licensing is starting to allow community networks to use cellular tech. And existing research has shown that the wide area nature of cell networks has, provides different affordances than traditional Wi-Fi mesh networks. But as we'll go into later, uh, because of the nature of rural and remote access in these small communities, Traditional metrics like coverage and ARPU don't really tell the whole story. So one of our core contributions of this paper is a unique and thorough view into the operations of a non-traditional internet network on the frontier of the web. Uh, we provide longitudinal measurements of use of the network and finances of the network. Also, we provide all of this as a large data set that's publicly available for further research. So specifically in this network, there's a lot of shared infrastructure. A big piece of that is the backhaul connection to the internet. In the network, there's a zero rated, so free, um, media server that has educational content that's curated by the school. Um, and then the LTE network itself uh, is attached to this the school's network. We performed a deep integration with the operator's billing and network operations support systems. Uh, and these are technical components of the cellular network, but basically that are in charge of keeping track of how much uh, data each user is using. The integration stores no packets, only the destination and a number of bytes. Uh, furthermore, these measurements are aggregated temporally into 20 minute chunks to prevent fine timing analysis. And all the IDs are locally encrypted with a key. So that allows the billing records to be mapped consistently to traffic uh, but this queue is destroyed at the end of data collection. So the final data set gathered spans 53 weeks of operation. It contains the list of billing transactions, and there are about 40,000 of those, and the list of anonymous traffic flows in the network. And there are about 75 million of those. Uh, these traffic flows were augmented with hand-assigned categories and organizations, and there's more details about that in the paper. Here are our key findings from this work. So first, when you start looking at the local versus internet traffic, um, this plot shows 
a timeline of the amount transferred per day in the network. And it's split between the internet downlink in blue, the internet uplink in orange, and all of the local traffic in red. As you can see, the local traffic is negligible relative to the internet traffic. And so even though there are zero rated services, local services in the network, um, and local services has, have received a lot of academic attention in the past, their impact in this real world network is marginal at best. So if we zoom in though on these local services and really look at exactly what's here, again, similarly, this uh, chart is the same as the previous one where it's a timeline showing the total amount transferred per day, but again, an order of magnitude smaller, this charts in megabytes instead of the other one was in gigabytes. Um, we see that local traffic does exist. There's a tiny amount of peer-to-peer -peer traffic in the network, but most of the traffic is interacting with that hosted media server. So we think that more popular local services that do achieve use could improve the network utilization a lot. Right now, the LTE part of the network is barely used at all. Um, and remove load from the constrained backhaul. So we also think that it's important to think about how local services could become more web friendly and move towards an idea of doing local caching instead. And this is difficult to do in the HTTPS world, although there's ongoing work at the IETF looking at the trade-offs involved in maybe enabling local, local caching in the modern web. So, also in this network, we categorize the different flows. And this chart shows for each hour of the day, on average, what the number of megabytes were for each category um, of flow. And so categories are things like video and this blue line, social media and this light blue line, and then many other categories that all are sort of dominated by video and social media. So as you can see, video is the largest share of traffic for all hours of the day. Uh, and we were really surprised that video plays a large role, even in this constrained network. Um, again, remember, it only has three megabits of shared bandwidth. Uh, and so we think this is interesting and think that rural operators need to anticipate heavy video usage on the modern web, uh, even with uh, low bandwidth networks. Furthermore, most of this video is coming from a few major media platforms. So YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok accounted for almost all of it. Uh, and these big services could better support small remote, remote networks. So we can look at this a different way and look at which packages are most frequently purchased. So this chart has the amount uh, purchased in the chain. And again, this is using a log scale in megabytes. Uh, and then the occurrence count of the, that purchase chain amount, also with a log scale. Uh, there are three notable outliers that are the most common purchase chain amounts at 10 megabytes, 20 megabytes, and 100 megabytes. And so the UI provides buttons for getting a 10 megabyte package, a 100 megabyte package, and a gigabyte package. You can see very few users are purchasing the gigabyte package, even though it's one with the buttons available. To put this in perspective, uh, these amounts are pretty tiny. So 100 megabytes is enough for 20 minutes of HD video or 50 minutes of low quality video. Um, and this 10 megabyte package, which is the second most common, uh, is less data than required to load the New York Times mobile optimized homepage with a cold cache. So in, with a flat pricing scheme, users are selecting small packages over large ones. And as we saw in the previous chart, they're making many purchases in a day when they're using data. Uh, I want to define two things. So we define an online day as a day where a user receives a single byte and the active period as the span between the first and last observed online day for a given user. So we can plot this ratio on and look at the distribution of users over their corresponding ratio. And what we see is that use is intermittent for many and there's a high variance between users. So you see this CDF is almost a straight line across all of the users in the network. Um, importantly, the median user is online only about every other day. Uh, 
And so the takeaway from this is that the coverage and the availability of a network connection is not equivalent to universal access to the internet and to the web. Now, cost could definitely be a factor um, in why access is so intermittent, or in why use is so intermittent, but there's insufficient data from this methodology to know, to know specifically why. And we're hoping to explore this more in future work. Beyond just uh, purchasing data intermittently, users often do not even have a credit balance stored in the network. And so they don't have the ability to purchase data on demand. Uh, when users don't have a credit balance, remember they have to go find a physical reseller and hand over cash. So this plot shows the time with non-zero credit for each user uh, as a ratio of their active time. Um, and again, is plotting CDF over all users. So we can see that 40% of users have credit available less than half the time in the network. Uh, and so networks with a social mission to provide consistent access, maybe for emergency services um, or communication with friends and family, may want to consider other billing models besides prepaid. So looking at the spending in the network, uh, this plot shows a for each user based on the number of days that user was active in the network. Uh, and then the mean purchase per active day for each user, where the size and color of the dot corresponds to the total amount purchased in the network. We can see that in most users consume little and are only mildly contributing to the network's revenue. So even in a small constrained network, utilization can be highly unequal, with small cohorts consuming significantly more than others. This really surprised us as the research team uh, since we thought most users would be saturated at the ceilings of the network's limited capacity. But we've found that there's actually a lot of variance in the amount that users use the network. So if we look at the actual cost and revenue of the network, this shows a timeline of the cumulative revenue in the orange line and costs in the blue line. Costs are made up of the initial 8,000 in capital expenditures, plus uh, the monthly operational expenditures of backhaul and preventative electrical maintenance, uh, in addition to a one-time lightning repair uh, for significant damage to the backhaul network. So we can see that this network breaks even after about six months of operation, uh, and that economically sustainable networks at the remote edge are achievable. Uh, but the, in this network, the low costs are critical, there's around $25,000 in equivalent revenue for the year, um, so there's not tons of room for overhead. Broken up by user cohorts, uh, we see actually a different story. So a, min a minority of users are driving the network's financial sustainability. In fact, almost half of the network's revenues come from around 20 users, uh, while the other 148 um, don't even contribute enough revenue for the network to be profitable. So missing these whale users when site surveying could make the difference between determining if the network will be profitable or not and could lead to a base station being deployed in a small town or that small town being passed over for some future time. It might be really hard to identify and anticipate these users in top-down planning due to just the small number of individuals involved. This is truly 20 users that are contributing half of the revenue for the entire network. So looking towards the future, uh, I believe that small networks have a large role to play at the edge of the internet, particularly because local entrepreneurs have these insights into where a network might be profitable uh, when it, in places that you might not expect. Uh, but these small networks are tough to observe in large scale data sets uh, conducted at the web and internet scale. I think we need more collaborations and publications partnering with these small networks. Edge operators and use cases need to contribute to discourse on network design and measurement. Also, there are new networks coming, uh, particularly low Earth orbit satellites like Starlink and Kuiper. But it's definitely a dynamic time in the space, and I'm excited to see where things go. So thank you for your attention during this short presentation. And if you found anything in here interesting or would like to learn more, please check out the paper uh, or reach out to me. Uh, my email is here in the slides.
Thanks again.